message yesterday for all of our Campus Day students. Wave at us, Campus Day students. Here's the interpretation, okay? Stop analyzing. Don't worry about what your family's going to say. Don't worry about where the money's going to come. Stop praying because all your prayers have been answered. And when you get here, you're going to have all the friendship, all the relations you want. So now, Campus State students, you just have to be a doer and go to enrollment and enroll and be here in August. Amen. That's the interpretation of yesterday. Hey, so stay with us one more time and help us welcome Pastor Mike Cavanaugh. Thank you, sir. Wow, thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. It's awesome. Okay, um, you, you, everybody have a handout that wants one. If you don't have one, lift your hand up. There'll be people around there. Okay, get your hand up. You want to do that. You, it'll help you to follow along with me if you have the handout because I kind of move along fast. And, uh, so they have their hands up and we'll, we're working to get those around to you. People are doing that. So keep your hand up in the air and they'll get them to you. I want to talk to you uh, this morning about eight questions that we need to ask before I decide to marry. Eight questions we need to ask. And we're going to be working from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you. It's like 40 verses long. But I'll be zeroing in on certain verses all the way through the... Uh, through the process that are right in your notes there that you have, so that'll help you be able to uh, follow along with me. So as, we're, as we're, we're looking at this chapter, this chapter was written in response to a question. There was a question that came to them, and, and to a Paul, and apparently the question was saying something like this. And it was saying, in our understanding, the only real acceptable lifestyle for a person to have is a married lifestyle. And uh, so we're wondering, is it okay if we get married in the situation that we're facing and the thing that's uh, going on here? And so Paul writes to them, and he's writing to want to balance some thoughts out. Not because he's against marriage. As a matter of fact, if you read the chapter over and over again, he makes this point. He says, to marry is okay, and to be single is okay. The problem is that these people didn't have at all any sense at all that to be single was okay. They didn't see that at all. They, could, they weren't connected in that kind of way. And so, so um, it, but in the chapter, he talks about some ideas that I think are absolutely foundational for a person to have the kind of preparation in their life that they, that they need before they would move into the idea of marriage. Okay, so, so uh, we're going to move along together here, and we'll start right with number one in your notes. Look right there, one, number one, it says says, uh, what is my gift or what is the will of God for my life today? This is one of the questions that has to be answered before I can get married. What is the will of God for my life today? 1 Corinthians 7 7 says, I wish that all men were as I am. Paul was single. He's saying, I wish everybody was like me. He says, I wish all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. He's got his own calling. He's got the thing that God has put on him. But each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, and another has that. So the first question should not be, should I get married? Am I supposed to get married? Should I get married? The first question you should have in your life is, um, what is it God wants me to do? What is the purpose of God for my life? What has God gifted me for? What am I here for? Now, if you think about that, you'll understand why this is so important. Because until a person defines their direction, they lack the essential information necessary for somebody to know whether somebody is supposed to be going with them, right? If I don't know where I'm going, how do I know if you and I are in alignment with each other? That is, we're moving in the same direction, uh, going in the same way. But it's so weird because so often people go the opposite way. That is, they have a tendency to become more passive rather than to become more clear on what is it God wants them to do with their life. Uh, In your notes, I put down a single's myth and a single's truth. Okay, a single's myth and a single's truth. This is what, here's the myth. If I don't have direction, I am more available to respond when the right person comes along. 
So the idea is, you know, here's direction, here's possibility, here's destiny, but I need to instead kind of put my life on hold. I can't, I don't want to commit to a direction, I don't want to commit to a mission, I don't want to commit to a calling, because once I commit to something, then I've kind of narrowed my field of who I'm going to end up in a relationship with, and so I don't want to do that. But here's the single's truth. A person with no direction... I, I, I call him a dust bunny, is not attractive to a person with direction. Now, now what do I mean by, when I, amen, okay. What do I mean by a dust bunny? Do you know what a dust bunny is? Uh, under your bed, uh, particularly if you're in a floor or, or in a room that has kind of a hard floor, under your bed sometimes there will form these dust bunnies. They're little accumulation, little dust balls that are under that. So we call those dust bunnies. And the thing about a dust bunny is a dust bunny is not going anywhere, right? Dust bunny has no mission. Dust bunny has no destiny. All a dust bunny does, if you walk by a dust bunny, the dust bunny is attracted to you and kind of follows you along. You see what I'm saying? That's what a dust bunny does. Many, many people have kind of committed themselves to kind of a dust bunny view of life. Uh, it's, like, it's like if you go, if you, you go to a, uh, a nice buffet, right? You go to a buffet, maybe you go to a wedding and they're having a buffet reception or something like that. And if you're, you know, you're a planner, you come up to that buffet and you say to yourself, okay, usually they have the salads and things first and then they have the really good stuff at the end, right? And so what I am going to do is be very light as I fill my plate up, right? I'm going to I'll have a little bit of that. Okay, ooh, just a little, little bit of that. Because in my mind, I'm thinking at the end of this line is something good. I'm going to really be able to fill my plate up. I'm going to really be able to do something. And so I'm going down, taking a little of this and a little of that. Now, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but you're going down the the buffet, a little of this, a little of that. You're going down the buffet, going down. And what you thought was entrees and more food turns out to be stacked dishes. And all at once you realize that you've been so careful at the beginning that you got to the end of the line and you don't have, your plate is not full, right? Your plate is not full. Well, many single people, that's exactly where they are in life. You're going through life, and you're kind of going through, and you're saying, well, I don't want to commit to anything. I don't want to, you know, fill my plate up, because if I fill my plate up, it's going to mess me up when I meet Mr. Right or Miss Right or this kind of thing. And so I'm just going to hold off, and just a little of this, a little of this, a little of this. And then all once you find yourself, you know, people move. They move all at once through their teens. They move through their 20s. They move through their 30s. And all at once you find yourself going, you know what? My life is passing me by, but my plate is never full. Because I put my life on hold. See, I put my life on hold. God can't speak to you about a mission. Forget that. You know, God, God wants to say to you, Afghanistan. And the first question in your mind is, are there any guys in Afghanistan? I don't, you know, if, I, I'm not sure that I want to do something like that. You know, because if I commit to that, if I commit to that direction all at once, all the people who are not going to Afghanistan have just been eliminated from partnership in my life. And so I'm thinking to myself, it's better not to commit. It's better not to have any direction. Better not to be going anywhere. Just kind of put my, just be a dust bunny. Just be a little dust bunny. I remember one time I was uh, traveling and and uh, this guy, he was, he was a, in his early 30s, dynamic, single guy, uh, worked in a big company and stuff. And he, so he invited me over to his, his house. So um, I go to his house. He lives in like a gated community, you know. And uh, so I said, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. So he's bringing me in. And he says, yeah, he says, I bought this house as an investment. You know, I thought it'd be kind of a cool thing. And, and so he goes, he brings me in, brings me to the house. The house is like awesome you know it's like like fantastic house and we go into the house and I'm shocked because the house is like decorated early salvation army you know what I mean he's got like a beanbag chair for a living room couch and he's got like an overturned wire spool for a kitchen table and he's got cement blocks and boards for a bookcase and and so after I get to know the guy a little bit I say to him I say to him hey I said uh I said, you got a beautiful house here. Yeah, I says, it's an investment. Oh, that's good. 
I said, uh, why don't you buy yourself some furniture? And he says to me, he says, well, you know, he says, I was going to buy some furniture. But then I thought to myself, what if Miss Wright doesn't like the furniture I buy? Okay, now, uh, catch on here for a second. This is not like the guy is going out with Joni and Joni doesn't like colonial. Okay, we're not talking like that. We're talking about Miss Wright. She does not really exist in space and time. You know what I'm saying? She is an idea, okay? So because someday I might meet somebody who doesn't like the furniture choices that I make, I'm going to live in a junkyard today. <laughs> See? And many people, it's not their house, but in terms of their lives and their life purpose and their life direction, they're living in a junkyard today because they have put their life on hold instead of getting their calling, instead of getting their destiny, instead of having a sense of mission, instead of having a sense of purpose. They're, they're dust bunnies. They put themselves into that place of passivity uh, in their life. We've got to shake this thing off. This knight in shining armor syndrome, this idea that I'm kind of a sleeping beauty and somewhere this knight is going to come along and kiss me and wake me up. Listen, let me say to you something. Your prince has already come. He came 2,000 years ago, okay? And you don't need to be waiting for anybody else to give you a kiss and wake you up. It's time to wake up right now. He's already here. He's already done what he's, he's needed to do. You know, you got to wait. You know, guys have the princess and the frog thing happening, you know, where they, keep, they feel a little froggy, you know, they feel a little green around the edges, but they just know that if the right princess gave them a kiss, they would be transformed into the prince that they really are underneath. Listen, let me say something to you. If you're feeling a little froggy, it's probably because you're a frog. And the best thing that you can do is make a decision today to become the best possible frog you can be. <laughs> Not wait for somebody to come along and turn you into something different than what you are. You need to be what you are and believe that God will provide and God will do everything that he needs to do in the days to come. So this is like such an important concept. We've got to shake off this passivity that grips our heart and this inability to grasp direction and mission and purpose because we've allowed that dust bunny spirit to fill our hearts. Okay, number two in your notes. Second question you need to ask before you get married. What are my weaknesses? But if they cannot control themselves, Paul says, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. My weaknesses have an impact on whether I should marry and who I should marry. If I have weaknesses in the area of self-control, if I have weaknesses in the area of anger, if I have weaknesses in the area of addictions, right? Here's the singles myth. Here's the myth. I need to find the right person. I need to find the right person. But the single's truth is this. The truth is I need to become the right person. A lot of us get this idea that somehow when you get married, problems get solved. That is, I have certain, I have certain issues, I have certain problems in my life, but once I get married, then those problems will disappear. But the truth is, marriage never solves problems. Listen to me now. Marriage never solves problems. Marriage only ever complicates the problems in your life and in your situation. Now, if you thought of it this way, think of yourself like you're a, uh, you're a box and you've got two or three problems bouncing around inside your box. You know, doosh, 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 and they're bouncing off each other. Doosh, 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 doosh. You got two or three problems. You got your box. Then imagine you meet another person, they are another box. And you put these two boxes together and you move the middle wall out between them. 
Now we got problems bouncing off of problems we never dreamed about before, right? You had, your, you had your life kind of pretty well down. You knew your problems, your two or three things that, you know, bounced around in there. But when that thing gets, re- now you got things bouncing off of things you never, you never thought of, right? Problems. Thinking somehow marriage is going to solve your problem. You know, sometimes people think marriage is going to solve my loneliness problem. It's so crazy. You know, I, I, you know, I feel lonely, you know. Here I am in downtown Dallas looking up at the ball there with the lights and everything. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, if I, if I just had Miss Wright with me, you know, it would just make this moment so special. And I wouldn't feel this loneliness anymore. I mean, when you think about it, you, you know, when they've done research, they found the loneliest people are not single people. The loneliest people are married people who lay their head down at night next to somebody who they've lost the ability to communicate with, they've lost the ability to connect with, and they feel absolutely alone. Absolutely alone. And yet somehow we get this idea that marriage is going to... Or, or, or sometimes it's, the, it's sexual temptation. You know, we think to ourselves, oh, I've got these, I've got these sexual temptations. If I, if I just got married, I wouldn't feel this anymore. You know, this wouldn't happen anymore. I think of... Um, I think of one situation I, I, I remember where, where a, a guy was struggling with all kinds of pornography and stuff like this. And, and so he goes to his pastor and he tells his pastor, you know, I'm struggling with all this stuff. And the pastor says to him, your problem is you just need to get married. So the guy goes out and he says, okay, this must be my problem. My problem is I just need to get married. So he goes out and he hunts around to find Miss Wright. And he, he makes this connection, this poor girl. He, gets, he marries her, he marries her, and then he still finds himself in the bathroom with pornography and doing all kinds of crazy things, because he thought that marriage would change him. If he doesn't face the issues, the sexual issues that he's dealing with as a single person, you don't get married and have those things go away. You say, well, why wouldn't the righteous relationship of marriage satisfy him? Because there's a very simple principle. You find it right in the book of Proverbs. Stolen water is sweet. Stolen melons. See, if you've developed a taste for that which is stolen, you'll never be satisfied with the righteous. You've got to deal with that thing that's going on in your life that can deliver you and set you free right now as a single person. Right now. And then you'll be prepared when you meet the right person. Not waiting for marriage to take away sexual temptation. Not waiting for marriage to take away your sense of loneliness. You need to find your wholeness and your completeness in Christ right now. Right now. Not putting your life on hold. Okay, number three. Does this decision to marry produce peace? 1 Corinthians 7, 15, it says this, But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. Romans 8, 6, The mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I remember years ago, a had a young couple I was uh, working with and uh, doing some premarital counseling with him. And they come in for, with the, both of them, and they come in for uh, counseling. And I, I can tell, like, tension all over the place. And so I start probing and talking to them, and it comes out in the conversation that uh, the guy got angry and punched her. Okay. Let me me just tell you, first of all, right now, there is no room in God's economy for a man who punches a woman, okay? That is loser behavior big time, and you need help if you find yourself in that situation. So anyway, this this guy punches the, the girl. So I'm sitting here with him now, and so I, I, you know, I'm talking back and forth, and, and I'm thinking to myself, no, wait a minute. You know, when you're engaged... This, this is probably the best it's ever going to be. You know what I mean? The guy is like on his best behavior, right? The girl is on her best behavior, right? 
The whole rest of your marriage, I've been married for 40 years, the whole rest of your marriage is going to be about straightening all the things you've been covering up out. And I'm thinking, if the guy punches her when they're engaged, what is the future going to look like? So I, so, so I said to the girl, I said, uh, I said, uh, do you have peace about this? I said it to both of them. Do you have peace about this marriage? And she says to me, well, the dresses have already been ordered. I said, okay, okay. I, I said, the dresses have been ordered. I said, but I said, I'm asking you guys, do you have peace about this? And uh, he says, well, the caterer's been booked. And I said, okay, 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 okay. I said, but I'm asking you, do you have peace? The invitations have been bought. They had all that, but they didn't have peace. And, uh, and so I sat with them as uh, the woman called her mother to tell her mother they were not going to get married because she didn't have any peace. The mother went ballistic. What? What is this, some cult you're in? You know, I couldn't tell her. The guy just popped your, your daughter in the face, right? I couldn't say anything, right? And I'm saying, I'm saying I, uh, listen, I agree with them. I don't think this is the right time. I don't think. Ah, you have to, ah, 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 ah. They went crazy. And then, you know, it's, it's, a funny, it's a funny deal. Time always wins out, you know. About 20 years later, the mother sees me someplace, comes up to me, is kissing me, kissing my hand, you know, you know saying to me, you saved our lives. You say, you know, we would have been, everything would have been destroyed if it wasn't for you. You know, sometimes you do the right thing. People don't cheer you on right at that moment. You know what I'm saying? Right at that moment, they're not cheering. But later on, they say, okay, singles myth, singles myth. If I don't set a goal, take the initiative, and make a relationship happen, I'll miss my chance for marriage. That's the myth. If I don't set a goal, take the initiative, and make a relationship happy, uh, happen, I'll miss my chance for marriage. Here's the truth. If you seek God's will and his peace every day, you will be exactly where God wants you to be. Okay? you got to seek God's will and his peace every day. I was talking about this one time and on, a, on a radio program, and uh, somebody called up, and, uh, and they said, no, wait a minute. They said, doesn't the Bible say, he who finds a wife finds a good thing? He says, how am I going to find her unless I look for her? Right? He who finds a wife. But it was a wrong understanding of the word find in that passage. That word find there does not mean to search for it means to find along the way. Okay? So, so catch, catch the picture here. Catch the picture. If I am, if I am walking around, you know, let, you, you know maybe you've, you've found money on the ground before or, or you know, that kind of thing, right? If, if you found money on the ground before, okay, great. That's wonderful. But if you bought into that so big that you thought to yourself, I think there must be money on the ground all over the place. I just never saw it before. Right? <laughs> And so you started walking around like this, searching for money everywhere you walked. We would say you were disturbed, right? You had a problem, right? If you find the money along the way, hey, I'm going along the way, oh, look, $10, find along, the way, then it's awesome, right? But if you search for what is awesome gets transformed into a sickness. Right? You're searching for it. On this same radio program, a uh, lady called up. She said, yeah, she said, in my church, we call that the Bride of Frankenstein Syndrome. The Bride of Frankenstein Syndrome. And I said, what? I said, what do you mean by that Bride of Frankenstein Syndrome? She said, well, well what will happen is this. She says, one of the, one of the believers will get into some kind of panic. Different things set people off. You know, you don't know what it's going to be. From, it, it, different, sometimes my younger brother or sister gets married, right? That makes me, you know. Maybe I reach a certain age, the age my parents got married, right? I passed that age. You know, I'm going to lose out here somehow. I'm going to lose out, right? So something happened that creates a panic. And so the person stops and starts digging in the dirt trying to find somebody. Now, when you dig in the dirt, there's no telling what you're going to find, right? So they dig in the dirt, they find somebody, 
and then they, 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 they kind of, you know, they, they, they want to prove that they're lovable, and they want to prove that they, and so they end up marrying that person. Now they married somebody that was not going in the same direction that they were going in. Never had the same vision that they had. Never had the same mission they had. Never had, and their life now is like them, you know, dragging this person along. And the, she, she, the, the lady that was talking to me on the radio, she said, yeah, she said, we call it the Bride of Frankenstein Syndrome. She said, what will happen is one of the brothers or sisters will go dig up some dead or almost dead, spiritually dead person, bring them to church and say, Pastor, can you zap them? You know what I mean? Can we just, can we, can we give them a, you know, Holy Ghost whack and bring them to life so I can marry them? <laughs> Marriage is a great thing uh, to happen in life, but it makes a lousy goal for your life. It makes a lousy goal. When you find it along the way, it can be an awesome thing. You know, that's what I think is supposed to happen. You're going along the way, right? So here I get my sense of destiny. I get my sense of mission. I get my sense of calling. Here I'm going, and I'm going after that. And as I'm going after the thing God has called me to, all at once I look over and go, hey, where are you going? (laughs) Me too. You want to go together? Now, two are better than one, right? Two are better than one, right? Listen, you know some people right now, you know some people right now that the two of them aren't nearly as good as any one of them is by themselves. You, you know, if you were a good friend, you would tell them, you know, you, you know this, is not, this, is not, this is not working. You know, what's happening here is not working. Okay, we'll keep going. Number four, does this decision to marry reflect a lack of contentment in my life. 1 Corinthians 7, 17, this is what he says. Nevertheless, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord assigned to him and to which God had called him. This is the rule I lay down in the churches. He, he basically is saying, are you at peace with who the Lord has made you right now? Are you circumcised or uncircumcised? He says it doesn't matter. Are you a slave or free? He says it doesn't matter. Are you single or married? He says it doesn't matter. He says what matters is, are you content with what God has given you right now in your life? My experience is I've got a lot of married people who want to be single, a lot of single people who want to be married, but nobody wants to be who they are. Right? You see, um, here, here's the myth. If I become content in my singleness, it is a sign that I will always be single. Many single people, they're absolutely afraid of the idea of being content as a single person. They think to themselves, this is, if I, you know, because their God is so small, he is so weak, that they say to themselves, God only gives, gives you somebody if you really need it, if you're really desperate. And, and if I'm content, God's going to look down from heaven. He's going to say, hey, you know, she's doing okay. Leave her like that. No problem. <laughs> you know, I only got so many to go around. She's making it. You know, that's fine. Leave her that way. <laughs> right? And so we think to ourselves, I don't want to come across as content. Instead, I want to come across as miserable. Right? So if I'm miserable, God will look down from heaven, have mercy on me, and send me somebody, right? It's exactly the opposite of what of what Paul is saying. Paul says you should be content in whatever state you find yourself. But no, I'm I'm gonna do here. Here's the singles truth. Contentment is a sign of a surrendered life and a commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what contentment is. It's a sign that you've said to God, you know, because I say to God today, God, I give you my life. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be what you want me to be. I just offer myself to you. Here I am right now. Because I say that to God, that doesn't mean that I'm never going to have a marriage or never have a relationship. Because I, you know, I'm giving myself to the Lord right now completely, 100%, without reservation, without holding back, trusting that he will provide for me exactly what I need. 
You know, there's a gift of the Spirit. It's called the gift of singleness. I don't know if you knew that. 1 Corinthians 12, he says, he says, having the gift that I have. The gift he's talking about is the gift of singleness. It's the one gift of the Holy Spirit nobody wants. You know, you can, you can envision it, can't you? You know, I, I bring a guy up here and I say, okay, we're just going to lay hands on this brother right now and, and just bless him right now and just going to impart gifts to him right now. So let's just like, Lord, we ask you to give him the gift of miracles. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And Lord, we ask you to give him the gift of healing. I'm yours, Lord, whatever you want. And Lord, we ask you to give him the gift of healing. Ah! Get your hands off my head! Gift of, he- of, of, of singleness? You know, no way, I don't want the gift of singleness. Right? The gift of singleness. And, and this, is, this, is, this is the kind of thinking that we have. Instead of realizing, you know what the gift of singleness is? It's, this isn't in your notes. You can just write this down. It's the gift of the grace of God to live victoriously as a single adult. That's what the gift of singleness is. It's the gift of the grace of God to live victoriously as a single adult. It doesn't mean that you're going to be single forever. That's not what it's saying. It's the gift of the grace of God that enables you to live victoriously during this season of your life. Some of you are struggling during this season of singleness. You're wondering why you're struggling because you're not even open to receive the gift that would enable you to have the contentment and the capacity to resist and overcome and be a victorious person as a single person. Because you're afraid if I receive that gift, God's going to leave me like this forever. He's going to leave me like this forever. I, I, you know, that, that's, he's, he's so poor, he's so weak, that if I somehow am contented, he's going you know, to give who would be my mate to somebody else. He, 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 he's going to say, I'm okay. Instead of you embracing totally what God is wanting to give you right now, to live victoriously as a single person. This place is quiet today. Okay, number five. (laughs) Number five. Are the circumstances such that marriage is the right decision at this time? 1 Corinthians 7.26 says, Because of the present crisis, Paul says, I think it's good for you to remain as you are. You know, they're asking him, should, you know, should we get married? He's saying, I think it's good for you to remain as you are. Right now, in this current situation, in this current circumstance, I don't think marriage is the right next step for you. Right? Because of the present crisis, he says, I think it's good for you to remain as you are. Here's the myth. Now is the time to be married. Now is the day of salvation. Second Mike 2.2, okay? <laughs> That's the myth. Now, we got we to gotta do it now. When sometimes the truth is, is, here's the truth right here. Waiting is often the best decision. Waiting is often the best decision. Um, you know, uh, I, I've seen situations. I, I think there can be, let me tell you some of the situations where I think waiting is significant. I think when your parents disagree, I think, and I'll talk to you about that, I, I think it's significant. When the person you're considering has some kind of life addiction, I, 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 I remember I had a woman come up to me at church one Sunday, and she said, Pastor, I'm going to be getting married in two weeks. And I said, really? I didn't, I didn't even know you were dating, I said to her. You know, you know who are you marrying? Well, it's this guy I formed a relationship with in prison. <laughs> really? Okay. Why was he in prison? Oh, he had a drug problem. Okay. And you're going to like, yeah, he's getting out of prison this next week, and we're going to get married the following week. And I said, I said to her, would you want to give him maybe a month or two, you know, out of prison, you know, just to see how he's doing, right? <laughs> waiting is waiting a possibility at all? Life addiction. If you have a lack of peace, we've already talked about if your spiritual leaders disagree, these are often things that really can help us. Let me share with you a personal, just something a little uh, personal from my own family. You know, I, my, my kids, uh, while we were growing up, I always taught them, you know, one of the ways you hear, you hear God, it's not the only way, but one of the ways is, and, and you have to have something like this, is hearing from the spiritual authorities in your life 
and from the, the people who have you know, that kind of leadership role in your life. That's one of the ways God speaks to us. Because here's the problem that happens. If I say the only way God can speak to me is through my little pea brain, basically. The only way he can speak to me is through. Then if I get confused for some reason, how is he going to get to me? And so uh, they all kind of committed together that, that basically they would stand with each other and, 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 and if they were making big decisions, they would talk to each They still do this to this day, uh, my three kids. They talk to each other before they do anything big, anything major, anything like that, and talk to us. And so anyway, my number two son, his name is Todd, he, uh, he is in college, meets this girl, and a really nice girl, really nice girl meets this girl, brings her home to meet the family, and everybody has a check. Everybody has, like, not the one. She, now, she is nice. I mean, she's nice, so many nice qualities. Uh, she was kind of a new believer, but really sincere, really great person in every way. And, and, uh, and yet everybody in the family has, has a check about it. And so you can imagine, Todd's, you know, his college, this is his girlfriend, he's, you know, all this kind of stuff, serious, he brought her home, wanted to meet everybody, everything else, and, and they're all, his brothers, his brother and sister, his mother, I'm, I'm probably the one that's most, you know, oh, maybe it'll work out, I don't know, you know, but nobody is enthusiastic, and, and, and his brothers, brother and sister and mother are, are they're like, they're saying she's a very nice person, but we don't think she's the one. So Todd goes home. Back to, back to college, and he wrestles with this, and finally he just comes to the place, and he tells this girl, for no reason, it's not like they're fighting, they're, having, they're, they're loving each other, you know, just laughing and enjoying connecting. He sits her down, and he tells her, he says, look, I just don't feel like I can do this. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ending this relationship. So the relationship ends. And I'm like praying, you know, God, help him find, you know, the right one, you know, if you, you know, just help him work, you know, now that his family screwed up what was, he was obviously happily doing, you know, you know, help him. Well, he didn't find anybody for, for over a year, right, after this breakup, well over a year, he's, he, 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 he's not, you know, every once in a while I'm sitting down going, hey, anybody coming up on the radar, you know, what's happening, you know, nothing, nothing. He's leading now this ministry and doing all this kind of stuff. And, and I was like praying now. Now I'm saying to God, okay, God, you know, did we screw this kid's life up? Did we, you know, did we, you know, did we mess this thing up? What's it, you know? And then while he's doing his ministry, he's following his call, doing the thing that God called him to do, he's involved in college ministry. He goes to this university campus, and there's a young woman who's leading the campus group. Uh, an RA, she is on the on on the campus. She's leading the campus group, and he meets her, and it's like he's totally knocked out, it's like head over heels, like totally, totally wiped out. And I can remember I can remember when he came home and talked to me about her. Her name is Elizabeth. He came home and talked to me about her, and he was like, "Dad, you know, I talked to her, you know, doing the ministry business." He said, and then I left, and then I thought, I can't just leave. I've got to talk to her again. I'm going to ask her out for coffee. So I looked at him, I said, you don't drink coffee. He said, I know, it's the only thing I could think of. <laughs> and so, you know, he went and, he went and asked her out for coffee, and they, you know, got together, and man, the thing unfolded. Turned out she was Miss New York State, uh, Miss America pageant. She was Miss New York State, you know what I mean? I tell, I tell other people, I say, I, say, uh, I say, a lot of you think your daughter-in-law is beautiful. I said, but in my case, I have the papers to prove it. You know, she, 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 she's certifiably beautiful, okay, and that kind of thing. And uh, uh, just, just to make, they came together, they're doing fantastic, all kinds of things happening. But what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is this. Sometimes waiting is the right thing. And the people that love you, they're going to try to signal to you. They're going to try to speak to you. They're going to try to say something to you to say, this is not going in the right direction. And you need to be, you need to be ready to hear what's, what's happening. Okay, keep, let's keep going. Number six. Does this decision to marry give Jesus Christ and his service first place in my life? I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, 
but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. All this counsel he's giving about singleness. He's saying, I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you. He says, I'm not trying to hang you up, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Here's the singles myth. The will of God is something I do while I'm on the way to doing the things I want to do, like getting married. So that's the way a lot of people approach their life. The will of God is something they do while they're on their way to do what they want to do. See? So, 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 so here I am. I'm, I'm, I, I, I've got this goal. I'm going to get married. That's my goal. And while I'm on my way to get married, I don't mind doing some things for Jesus along the way. What do you want me to do? I'll go a little mission trip, help out here, help out there. But I am the one who holds the goal. I am the one who holds the direction, the, 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 where things are going, see? And I'm willing to do godly things along the way. You want me to do a few little Christian things here along the way? I love to do that. Yeah, no problem. That's good, right? But I'm holding the, the, the center place in, in this situation. You know, you could be here at CFNI exactly like that. You could be here, you know, your parents thought it was a good idea, you liked it, music is cool, place is cool, good place to hang out with people, and everything else. But the truth is you've never yielded the ultimate direction of your life. You are, you are happy to do some godly things while you're going after the thing that you want. Rather than going after the thing that God wants and, 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 and doing things that are happening there. Okay, here's the singles truth. As I seek to fulfill God's will first, he will provide for all of my needs, including relationships and everything else. If I put him first and seek his kingdom first, he will provide for me. Number seven. Am I prepared to enter into the union of marriage for life? A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the what? He must belong to the Lord. Okay, here's the singles myth. Love will make your marriage last. That is so full of baloney. Love never has made a marriage last, okay? Let me tell you what makes a marriage last right here. Here's the truth. Commitment, a promise, is the only glue that keeps a marriage together for the long haul. Romantic love will rise and fall, but agape love is rooted in commitment, okay? It's, you know, it's not the ro romance that can, you know, I've been married for, for 40 years, okay, 40 years, my wife and I are nothing like what we were when we first got married. The romance and the tingles and the excitement and all the stuff that I felt when we first got married, we're just not the same people. People change. You know, you're, you're looking at this guy and you're going, oh man, I just love to rub my hands through your hair. And then one day, one day you rub. No hair. Right? He says, he says, oh, honey, you know, I love your figure. Oh, honey, I love your, your figure. Oh, honey, what's happening to your figure? I don't, I don't know. I don't. <laughs> we are not the same people today that we were 40 years ago. And all through our relationship, we've had to come again and again to places where we, where we renew our commitment. The thing that holds us together isn't the romance of the moment. It's the promise, the commitment that we've made to each other. That's what holds you together and, and enables you to get to the other side where you can, where you can uh, really experience the depth of what real love relationship is supposed to be where you're, you're absolutely secure in your relationship with the other person. Even when you're a jerk, you know they're committed to you. And so you can start working on some things that so often we don't get to work on, okay? Because of, of a relationship that's absolutely connected in that way. Okay, number eight. Am I marrying a believer? Did I just do this one? No, I didn't. No, you know, union for life. Okay, am I marrying a believer? Here it is. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives... But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. Here's the singles myth. 
God has led me to a person that though they are not a Christian and have some habits that are not pleasing to God, I believe they will change after we are married. Okay? That's called missionary dating. Missionary dating, right? Find some, that's, that's the bride of Frankenstein syndrome right there. God has led me to a person that though they are not a Christian and they have some habits that are not pleasing to God, I believe they will change after we are married. Okay? I, I remember one gal telling me one time, she said, this guy is nicer to me than any Christian guy has ever been. And you know what? I believe it. I believe it. But it doesn't change the truth of this scripture. He must belong to the Lord. Here's the single's truth. Why would God lead you to someone who violates his clear biblical standards for your life? Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? For what fellowship can light have with darkness? Okay, let me, let me end with this story. So I'm a pastor in upstate New York in uh, the uh, town of Oswego, New York. We're getting a lot of squeaking happening here. I, 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 you guys don't know me. I've, I've come here like 10, 12 times. I will always end by 12 o'clock. You're guaranteed. You're not going to be held out. Okay? Okay, so, so I'm, I'm in Oswego, New York. Well, I'm saying that to say you don't need to pack up now. You will have time to pack up. Okay? Just relax. Okay, I always end by 12 o'clock. You can, it's just it's part of my commitment to you. As you, I expect you to be committed to me during the time that we're talking together. Okay, so let me tell you the story. So I'm in Oswego, New York. I'm a relatively new pastor. And uh, uh, in, we've got a real thriving thing happening. And this, this uh, gal comes to me from part of our, our group. Uh, and, she, and she says, uh, I could tell something was wrong. Her countenance was just kind of falling. She was kind of... And so I made an appointment with her, and I said, uh, what, what is happening with you? I said, you just don't seem like you're the same person you were. What, you know, what's going on? And she struggled for a second, and then she said, she said, well, there she says, there's this guy. She said, this guy at church. And she said, I'm just really messed up. She said, I just feel these tremendous feelings toward him and things like that. And there was something about the way she said it that I said to her, have you ever... Have you ever talked to this guy? Do you know him even? And she hung her head down, and she said, no, I haven't really talked to him. So, you know, now I'm thinking, Heesh. you know, how do you help her with a, pro you know, I want to help you with this guy that, that really is, you don't even have a relationship with, you know, you haven't even interacted with, you don't have any contact with, but, you know. And I didn't know what to say to her because she was just all torn up. I just didn't have a good response, you know, no take two scriptures and call me in the morning. I just couldn't, I couldn't, come, I couldn't come up with the right words to say to her. So she ends up, I pray with her, she leaves. Several weeks later, I'm walking in the downtown of Oswego, and she's walking up to the street toward me, and I, I, look, I look at her, and she's transformed. Her countenance is transformed. Everything about her is transformed. And so I walk up to her, and I say, I take her hand, and I say, well, I said, did you talk to him? You know, because she's lit up, you know. And uh, she says, no. She says, I had, the, I had the most wonderful experience. And I really, I said, w what happened? She said, well, the other morning, she said, I was out running along Lake Ontario, up in Oswego, New York, along Lake Ontario. And I ran by the old military fort that was there. There's an old Revolutionary War fort right on the lake. And she says, I was running by the fort. Next to the fort, there was a a, an, a, a graveyard, a military graveyard, old military graveyard from those revolutionary days. And in the center of the graveyard was a large, rough-hewn wooden cross. And she said, as I began to run by the graveyard, she said, I looked in and I saw this cross. And she said, I felt compelled to turn and to run in. And so she turned and she ran into the, uh, she ran into the um, graveyard and she ran up to where this cross was and and then she dropped down on her knees in front of the cross. And she looked at me and she said, Mike, she said, I began to dig in the ground with my fingers. She said, I dug through the grass. I dug into the dirt. She said, and then I cut my hands. And she said, I took the dream of 
the relationship with this guy. And she said, I put it in the hole, and I pushed the dirt back on top, and I put the grass back on top, and I got up and I ran away. And she said, Mike, she said, I'm free, she said, because I left it at the foot of the cross. Now, the story has an interesting ending because a year later, the church was sending a mission trip to Mexico. And we were driving from upstate New York to Mexico. So it was like many, many hours in the van, right, driving. And there were like eight people that signed up for the mission trip. And this girl was one of those eight people. And this guy was one of those eight people who she still has not really interacted with, this, this, this guy. She just kind of let it go. This guy is one of the people. Somewhere in Mexico, the guy looks across the van and goes, the one, the one, you know, you know, <laughs> she's the one. And they come back and within, a, within 18 months or so, they end up getting married. Now, I hesitate to tell that story for the fear that the next time I go to Oswego, I'll go to that graveyard and there'll be little holes all over the graveyard <laughs> with Christ for the Nation bumper stickers <laughs> laying there because you went there to bury your dream of, of a relationship so that God could give it back to you. You know, God could... But let me, let, let, me, let me say this to you. There has to come a moment of surrender. You know, many times you've been holding a dream in your heart from the time you were a little child. An ideal of what life was supposed to be like and when you were going to meet Mr. Right and what your marriage was going to be and how this was going to happen. And, 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 and guys and gals both. You, you, you hold a dream in your heart, and you don't really realize how firmly that thing has taken root inside of you and that you have never really come to the place to yield to God his right to have you marry who he wants you to marry, when he wants you to marry, that basically your life is not your own. You've been bought with the price, the blood of Jesus Christ, and giving your life into his hands. And so I just want you right now, would you just bow your heads right now? Just bow your heads right now where you are. And I want you to see yourself right now as if you, as if you were running to that cross. And I want you to cup your hands in front of you. And I want to ask you, what is the unyielded dream? Is it a relationship? Is it, is it marriage? Is it, you know, uh, the, the little house with the white picket fence and 2.2 children and just this model, this image, this middle class image that you've, that you've absorbed into your soul? Whatever that dream is, I want you to take it right now and just put it in the ground and leave it at the foot of the cross. And say goodbye to this thing. And give God permission to do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, in the way he wants to do it. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire compares with you. Would you tell him that? And nothing I desire compares with you. And nothing I desire compares with you. Oh, nothing 
desire compares with you. Transform us, Lord. Transform us. Give us that trust that you will provide for every need. Nothing we desire compares with you. Amen. Thank you. Thanks.
If I don't have direction, I am more available to respond when the right person comes along. So the idea is, you know, here's direction, here's possibility, here's destiny, but I need to instead kind of put my life on hold. I can't, I don't want to commit to a direction, I don't want to commit to a mission, I don't want to commit to a calling, because once I commit to something, then I've kind of narrowed my field of who I'm going to end up in a relationship with, and so I don't want to do that. But here's the single's truth. A person with no direction... I I call him a dust bunny, is not attractive to a person with direction. Now, now what do I mean by, when I, amen, okay. What do I mean by a dust bunny? Do you know what a dust bunny is? Uh, Under your bed, uh, particularly if you're in a floor or, or in a room that has kind of a hard floor, under your bed sometimes there will form these dust bunnies. They're little accumulation, little dust balls that are under that. So we call those dust bunnies. And the thing about a dust bunny is a dust bunny is not going anywhere, right? Dust bunny has no mission. Dust bunny has no destiny. All a dust bunny does, if you walk by a dust bunny, the dust bunny is attracted to you and kind of follows you along. You see what I'm saying? That's what a dust bunny does. Many many people have kind of committed themselves to kind of a dust bunny view of life. uh, It's like like if you go go to a a nice buffet, right? You go to a buffet, maybe you go to a wedding, and they're having a buffet reception or something like that. And if you're, you're a planner, you come up to that buffet and you say to yourself, okay, usually they have the salads and things first, and then they have the really good stuff at the end, right? And so what I am going to do is be very light as I fill my plate up, right? I'm going to have a little bit of that. Okay, just a little little bit of that. Because in my mind, I'm thinking at the end of this line is something good. I'm going to really be able to fill my plate up. I'm going to really be able to do something. And so I'm going down, taking a little of this and a little of that. Now, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but you're going down the the buffet, a little of this, a little of that. You're going down the buffet, going down. And what you thought overturned wire spool for a kitchen table, and he's got cement blocks and boards for a bookcase. And and so after I get to know the guy a little bit, I say to him, I say to him, hey, I said, uh, I said, you got a beautiful house here. Yeah, he says, it's an investment. Oh, that's good. I said, uh, why don't you buy yourself some furniture? And he says to me, he says, well, you know, he says, I was going to buy some furniture. But then I thought to myself, what if Miss Wright doesn't like the furniture I buy? Okay? Now, uh, catch on here for a second. This is not like the guy is going out with Joni and Joni doesn't like Colonial. Okay? We're not talking like that. We're talking about Miss Wright. She does not really exist in space and time. You know what I'm saying? She is an idea. Okay? So because someday... I might meet somebody who doesn't like the furniture choices that I make. I'm going to live in a junkyard today. (laughs) See? And many people, it's not their house, but in terms of their lives and their life purpose and their life direction, they're living in a junkyard today because they have put their life on hold instead of getting their calling, instead of getting their destiny, instead of having a sense of mission, instead of having a sense of purpose, they're they're dust bunnies. They put themselves into that place of passivity uh, in their life. We've got to shake this thing off. This knight in shining armor syndrome, this idea that I'm kind of a sleeping beauty And somewhere this night is going to come along and kiss me and wake me up. Listen, let me say to you something. Your prince has already come. He came 2,000 years ago, okay? And you don't need to be waiting for anybody else to give you a kiss and wake you up. It's time to wake up right now. He's already here. He's already done what he's, he's needed to do. You know, you got to wait. You know, guys have the princess and the frog thing happening, you know, where they, keep, they feel a little froggy, you know, they feel a little green around the edges, but they just know that if the right princess gave them a kiss, he's writing to want to balance some thoughts out. Not because he's against marriage. As a matter of fact, if you read the chapter over and over again, he makes this point. He says, to marry is okay, 
and to be single is okay. The problem is that these people didn't have at all any sense at all that to be single was okay. They didn't see that at all. They, could, they weren't connected in that kind of way. And so, so um, it, but in the chapter, he talks about some ideas that I think are absolutely foundational for a person to have the kind of preparation in their life that they, that they need before they would move into the idea of marriage, okay? So, so uh, we're going to move along together here, and we'll start right with number one in your notes. Look right there, one, number one. It says, says uh, what is my gift, or what is the will of God for my life today? This is one of the questions that has to be answered before I can get married. What is the will of God for my life today? 1 Corinthians 7, 7 says, I wish that all men were as I am. Paul was single. He's saying, I wish everybody was like me. He says, I wish all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. He's got his own calling. He's got the thing that God has put on him. But each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, and another has that. So the first question should not be, should I get married? Am I supposed to get married? Should I get married? Should I? The first question you should have in your life is, um, what is it God wants me to do? What is the purpose of God for my life? What has God gifted me for? What am I here for? Now, if you think about that, you'll understand why this is so important. Because until a person defines their direction, they lack the essential information necessary for somebody to know whether somebody is supposed to be going with them, right? If I don't know where I'm going, how do I know if you and I are in alignment with each other? That is, we're moving in the same direction, uh, going in the same way. But it's so weird because so often people go the opposite way. That is, they have a tendency to become more passive rather than to become more clear on what is it God wants them to do with their life. Uh, in your notes, I put down a single's myth and a single's truth. Okay, a single's myth and a single's truth. This is what, here's the myth. Message yesterday for all of our campus day students. Wave at us, campus day students. Here's the interpretation, okay? Stop analyzing. Don't worry about what your family's going to say. Don't worry about where the money's going to come. Stop praying because all your prayers have been answered. And when you get here, you're going to have all the friendship, all the relations you want. So now, campus day students, you just have to be a doer. And go to enrollment and enroll and be here in August. Amen. That's the interpretation of yesterday. Hey, so stay with us one more time and help us welcome Pastor Mike Cavanaugh. Thank you, sir. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. It's awesome. Okay, um, you, you, everybody have a handout that wants one. If you don't have one, lift your hand up. There'll be people around there. Okay, get your hand up. You want to do that. You, it'll help you to follow along with me if you have the handout because I kind of move along fast. And, uh, so they have their hands up, and we'll, we're working to get those around to you. People are doing that. So keep your hand up in the air, and they'll get them to you. I want to talk to you uh, this morning about eight questions that we need to ask before I decide to marry. Eight questions we need to ask. And we're going to be working from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you. It's like 40 verses long. But I'll be zeroing in on certain verses all the way through the, uh, through the process that are right in your notes there that you have. So that'll help you to be able to uh, follow along with me. So as, we're, as we're, we're looking at this chapter, this chapter was written in response to a question. There was a question that came to them, and, and it's to a Paul, and apparently the question was saying something like this. And it was saying, in our understanding, the only real acceptable lifestyle for a person to have is a married lifestyle. And uh, so we're wondering, is it okay if we get married in the situation that we're facing and the thing that's uh, going on here? And so Paul writes to them, and it was entrees and more food turns out to be stacked dishes. And all at once you realize that you've been so careful at the beginning that you got to the end of the line and you don't have, your plate is not full, right? Your plate is not full. 
Well, many single people, that's exactly where they are in life. You're going through life, and you're kind of going through, and you're saying, well, I don't want to commit to anything. I don't want to, you know, fill my plate up, because if I fill my plate up, it's going to mess me up when I meet Mr. Wright or Miss Wright or this kind of thing. And so I'm just going to hold off, and just a little of this, a little of this, a little of this. And then all once you find yourself, you know, people move. They move all at once through their teens. They move through their 20s. They move through their 30s. And all at once you find yourself going, you know what? My life is passing me by, but my plate is never full. Because I put my life on hold. See, I put my life on hold. God can't speak to you about a mission. Forget that. You know, God, God wants to say to you, Afghanistan. And the first question in your mind is, are there any guys in Afghanistan? I don't, you know, if, I, I'm not sure that I want to do something like that. You know, because if I commit to that, if I commit to that direction, all at once, all the people who are not going to Afghanistan have just been eliminated from partnership in my life. And so I'm thinking to myself, it's better not to commit. It's better not to have any direction. Better not to be going anywhere. Just kind of put my, just be a dust bunny. Just be a little dust bunny. I remember one time I was uh, traveling and and uh, this guy, it was, he was in his early 30s, dynamic, single guy, uh, worked in a big company and stuff. And he, so he invited me over to his, his house. So um, I go to his house. He lives in like a gated community, you know. And uh, so I said, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. So he's bringing me in. And he says, yeah, he says, I bought this house as an investment. You know, I thought it'd be kind of a cool thing. And, and so he goes, he brings me in, brings me to the house. The house is like awesome you know it's like like fantastic house and we go into the house and I'm shocked because the house is like decorated early salvation army you know what I mean he's got like a beanbag chair for a living room couch and he's got like an 